from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwags. Tonight's story, Race to Hoquiam. Hello there. We've talked about some of Grays Harbor's prominent athletes, but tonight we're going to talk about one amongst the earliest. Moreover, it was a Simon Pure event that had the town talking and laughing too. It was back in the days when folks were talking about what Admiral Dewey did at Manila Bay and Teddy Roosevelt did at San Juan Hill. And it all started in that familiar haunt of Aberdeen men town about town, Dr. W. B. Payne's drugstore. We're going to make way for Dick Crombie to have his customary few words from our sponsor and then we'll be back with our t story for tonight. Now as some of you may have gathered, and all of the real old-timers will recall, Doc Payne's drugstore at number 29 Heron Street, before the fire, was the hangout of most of Aberdeen's hell fellows. Yes, the eligible bachelors, the young gay blades, the town's businessmen out for an evening, all dropped into Doc Payne's drugstore. There they met their friends, perhaps braced themselves with a little touch of stimulant to keep the dampness out of their bones. There was a barrel of spirituous fermentus in the back room, a tin cup, and a cigar box for a nominal fee. And in fact, it was the sort of club before clubs and lodgers became popular. There was a cribbage game that went on almost continuously. When one contestant moved out, another took his place, and the cards, worn by constant handling, were replaced periodically by the owner of the pharmacy as part of the firm's public service. So much of an institution was the drugstore that the Aberdeen Elks Lodge is actually an outgrowth of that meeting place. Yes, that's the story the old timers have told me. The men who made Doc Payne's drugstore their hangout talked themselves into starting a lodge and the lodge was the Elks. And that in turn became their club when Doc Payne finally gave up filling prescriptions and turned to real estate and insurance. The present firm of Payne and O'Day, now operated by Pinckney O'Day, is the organization that Doc started. But to get back to our story, two of the hangers on at Doc's drugstore were Grove Antrim, the bookkeeper at the American Mill, and Dr. Seth Maker of whom we have often spoken. And a very remarkable little man was he. One of the other men about town had one evening referred to the running ability of short-legged men as compared to that of long-legged men and compared Atrim and Doc Martin. Antrim, you see, was tall and thin. Doc Mar Maker was short and stocky. Well, as those things did in the days long ago when people made their own fun, the controversy got out of hand and Doc challenged his long-legged friend to a foot race. It was to be held and it was to be held and be a one block dash. There were to be wagers, a pot of money to the winner. Now I said people made their own fun back in those days and they did. And the gang that hung out at Doc Payne's drugstore went out to spread the story of the race. They dropped a word here and there, took sides as to whom would win. Some made little side bets on the outcome, and the event began to build up interest. But the self-appointed committee to promote the race between Doc Maker and Grove Antrim had not reckoned with one thing, the enthusiasm of the contestants. As the days went by, the self-styled promoter found it was going to be no small task to get the two men together for a race. When one could run, the other was busy and vice versa. So a week dragged by and then another, and then came one of those crisp autumn evenings in October when the harvest moon looked down on the little sawdust town and Heron Street. 
the gay white way of Grays Harbor was at its gayest. It was a Saturday night, and in those days, that was a late night for those wooden cities. Stores didn't close until 10 o'clock, and often their clerks and management attended some social activity afterwards. It was the thing to do downtown at midnight, and many young men of the town saw the sunrise on Heron Street. Well, it was late in the evening when Grove Antrim sauntered into Doc Payne's drugstore and was followed a short time later by Doc Maker. Everyone in the drugstore who was interested in the much-talked-about foot race felt that now was as good a time as any for the race. So while the argument waged hot as to which was a better runner, by this time it had become a friendly feud. Others of the group went up and down Heron Street and stirred up the crowd. The word was planted in almost every one on the town's 18 saloons and spread along the streets. The race was to be run soon after midnight. The course would be the new planking on Market Street between G and H Street. Now, such an event at that time of the morning would probably draw little more than two contestants today. But back in those days, it was exciting news, and a continuous stirring of queries came to Doc Payne's office asking when the race was to be held. It was going to be run for certain. Did anyone want to put up $10 on Doc Maker? And what was the starting time? Jim Fuller, Aberdeen City Treasurer, whose sharp memory stretches into Grace Harbor's past like a searchlight picking out an antidote, recalls that the town was more worked up over that race than it had been over the Spanish-American War. Well, they finally got the two contestants to talk in, talked into making the run with much ceremony. The whole gang at Doc Payne's drugstore started for Market Street. It was now well after midnight, but a big crowd followed the contestants. The tall, thin man and the short, stocky man in their derby hat and long coats. The saloons filled with late-goers home empty, and some of them looked as their proprietors joined the crowd. The dance hall on Hume Street was emptied as the frolickers moved in a body movement towards Market Street. And when the contestants stood on the starting line at G Street, both sides of Market Street were lined from G to H. The crowd was a little thin at Moulton's Furniture Store in the middle of the block, but it thickened at the starting and finishing lines. Now, as I mentioned, the two men who figure prominently in this athletic contest were dressed for an autumn evening in their derby hats and overcoats. And as they came to the line to start the dash, they took off their coats and looked for someone to pile them onto. And there was Freddie Green. Freddie was the University of Michigan boy who had been quite a track man back there at Ann Arbor, and he was keenly interested in this contest, and possibly a little bit biased in favor of the doctor because Freddie himself was a short leg sprinter. So Freddie was made custodian of the coats and derby hats, and the two athlete, athletes went to the line. There was nothing like the crouch toe hold splinter start. It was just a brace yourself to get going and start. And the two men assumed their positions. Meanwhile, last minute bets were being covered by some of the town sportsmen walking along the curb with bills between their fingers. The white mean moon shone down on the strange sight, a sight that couldn't be duplicated today. For today, people regretfully or thankfully are different. It was nearly 4 a.m. There was three or four hundred of the city's population at that time when it represented probably 10% of the population of Aberdeen were watching the race. A starter shouted, On your mark! The runners braced themselves. Get set! They leaned forward. Then go! And they were off. Doc Maker, his stubby legs driven like piston shots into the immediate lead, but Atrum, although out jumped at the start, managed to keep up, and as they covered yard after yard, appeared to be gaining. The crowd was now cheering its favorites wildly and surging forward to the finish line when the two runners and Soth 
Thoroughly did the crowd concentrate on the running pair, the tall, thin man and the short, stubby man, that they failed to notice that Freddie Green, loaded down with co coats and derby hats, was also in the race. Freddie, who had been in on the start, dashed off after the two contestants. In fact, before he had covered one quarter of the distance, he was in the lead. To encourage Doc Maker, his favorite, he turned and ran backwards, shouting words of encouragement and advice to the stubby runner. Atrium was closing the gap, and as they came to the midpoint in the race, and Doc, with his short but driving strides, was losing ground, still Freddie Green ran ahead of them, urging them on, shouting to them with advice and counsel, and yet hardly able to see the runners over his armfuls of overcoats and derby hats. Well, at three-quarters mark, Atrium had cut off Doc Martin's lead and was forging ahead, and Freddie Green ran alongside his favorite, pleading, urging, challenging him to increase his speed. The derby hats were bouncing around the top of the overcoats, and Freddie was flying blind with his head buried in the coats, but he shouted advice to no avail. The doc was doing his best. He could hear the several hundred voices of those who had bet on his stumpy legs, urging him to increase his stride. But the sprinters but sprinters are born, not made, and Grove Antrim crossed the finish line well ahead of the puffing doctor in what was probably the most exciting race ever run on Market Street. And this was the and it was only as the runners crossed the finish line that someone noticed that ten feet ahead of either contestant, although he was laden down with overcoats and derby hats, was young Freddie Green. And that thought of the lad carrying a handicap, starting late and coming in first after having run half the distance backward, provided a laugh even for those citizens who had unfortunately bet their dollars on the short-legged doctor. The crowd flocked backward, flocked back down Heron Street to see the sun come up, still talking about the race down Market Street at 4 o'clock in the morning between the tall, thin bookkeeper and the short, stocky dentist that was won by a young fellow who held their coats and hats. And now, a word from Dick Crombie and our sponsors. Well, we're starting a new year, and there's lots of things that will happen before this string of 12 months assumes the title of an old year, and the bows, bows out to make way for another. It's always been that way, and each year in Grays Harbor's history, We've chalked it up to share the honors. Take the year of 1908. That was the year when wireless first spanned the ocean to Grace Harbor. The new wireless station, that's what they called it then, had just been finished at Westport. And in October of that year, the Coast Guard station in Hawaii flashed greetings across the Pacific from the governor of Hawaii to the Pacific Northwest. They were picked up at Westport and relayed to the mayor major cities and ports of the Northwest, and the folks of Grays Harbor scratched their heads and muttered that Moss covered old whimsy. What won't they do next? Well, it really proved to be just a passing event, hardly worth recording, but it was the first trans-oceanic radio message to be picked up in Grays Harbor, and it did, in its own way, distinguish the year of 1908. What the year of 1950 will bring to Grace Harbor will only be able to report when this year has become part of our scrapbook and its events part of the legends of your hometown. Thank you for listening.